Imrad. To which we add the key words. The introduction should give the aim of your study, of your paper. The introduction is a bridge between what the average reader should know or knows, according to the writer, or what is known and not known. You want to bridge, you want to cover that gap and say why more material is needed to cover that gap. So the introduction is short. Once you've said that, at the end, you're going to state your goal. You're going to pose a question or you're going to raise a hypothesis. That's the last sentence, or at least the last paragraph of your introduction. What is known, what is not known? What should be known because of the study that we're going to engage in? I like to use the PICO framework for that last sentence. Everybody know what PICO stands for? Have, they heard it Have you heard it before? PICO, Population, Intervention, Comparator, Outcome. We hypothesize that patients with peritonitis, this is our population, receiving antibiotics for three days, this is our intervention will have fewer surgical site infections. This is our outcome. And patients receiving antibiotic prophylaxis only. This is our comparison. We have those four items in one sentence, and we know where we're going. Next chapter, material and methods. Some journals are very particular about the word material when it's talking about human beings. So don't hesitate to use the word study participants or patients, especially for the British, much more than the Americans. This chapter defines the population. It defines what you did specifically in what order you did it, or how you did it, or why you did it sometimes, how the data were analyzed, and eventually if the ethical issues, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. What's most important, and one of the most common errors that we see, is that material methods has other things than material methods. This is wrong. Only material methods. No details. If you have details that you want to relate, you can put them into an annex. You can put them outside, and that's something that you have to tell the editor when you write your cover letter. You can use references as often as possible. If, some, if a material, if a method is lengthy, it's already been done, you don't have to describe it again. as I say, can be in the form of annexes, like you see here. Only objective facts, no interpretations, no comments, no discussion. This does not belong in material methods. It's gonna be very short, very straightforward. Take a look at this example especially this sentence, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents were not used in the treatment of pain because, no, that's a comment. It's an explanation. It does not belong in methods. If that is important, put it in the discussion. And would require a reference anyhow. You're gonna be using tables and figures for several chapters. 
It's also an exercise, but you have to make sure that you don't repeat information in the text that is obvious in the tables and vice versa. It's a balance that sometimes is difficult to obtain. It has to be worked on. The reader should find what I call positive numbers and negative numbers. Positive numbers are, for instance, in a controlled randomized trial, as you heard Professor Boni talk about, the consort flowchart, are the number of patients that you're dealing with. And with a randomized controlled trial, or even sometimes a controlled trial, whatever, you have a certain amount of eligible patients or subjects, but you don't always include all of them. So you have to state from the eligible population, the population that you're talking about, whether you do it by randomization or whatever selection process you use, how many patients are in each group allocation for a randomized trial or just present because of whatever your study design is in each group? How many actually receive the treatment, especially in randomized controlled trials, because you can have dropouts, you can have crossovers, you can have um, withdrawals. How many after the allocation or the selection of groups were actually followed up? These numbers can differ. People die, people drop out, people don't like what's going on. And then third chapter, how many were actually analyzed? All this information is very important in material methods. This is what I call positive numbers. But negative numbers are also important. And those are <coughs> the difference between the eligible patients and those that were entered, for whatever reason it is. It may be that you, for instance, I'm gonna talk about a study that's probably very dear to Dr. Talamini, coming out of Cameron's group on the use of octreotide for the prevention of pancreatic fistula. When you look at that study, you find that there's as many patients that were eligible but not included as that, that were randomized, but we don't know why. This is not good, because you can ask the question, why were these patients not included? So we'd have to know how many of the eligible patients were included. And I don't like the word excluded. Can I say I didn't put that in style? You see the word excluded. I prefer the word not included. Once again, semantics. Excluded theoretically means it was already included and then withdrawn. Or it can mean that. If you use the word excluded, you don't know if it was before or after they were included. So avoid the word excluded, use the word included, not included, included, withdrawn. Negative numbers also mean crossovers. And when you're talking about an intention to treat, this is important. Negative numbers means those that are lost to follow up. Negative numbers means those that were followed but were not analyzed for whatever reason it is. So positive numbers, negative numbers. There is a guideline that you heard about and you saw on one of the slides of Professor Boni, the clear statement, and all these items are detailed. Written by Isabel Boutron from Paris. Very good paper. If you wanna jot down that reference. Very important in material methods is the modality of inclusion, especially for randomized controlled trials, but also even for cohort studies. This is one of the major sources of bias, selection bias. So if your patient population was consecutive, which is ideal, state it. If you don't state it, people are gonna ask the question, and I would say, that this is part of your discussion. You have to, in your discussion, say why the patients were not consecutive. You have to be honest when you write. We have to know 
if there was a selection bias. Most important, of course, is intention to treat, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but I'm sure everybody knows that when you do a randomized controlled trial, you have to analyze the patients as they were allocated by randomization, even if they did not get the treatment that they were supposed to. And you can do also another analysis, which is per protocol, in other words, what they actually got, and compare the two to make sure that there's no bias in the fact that there were too many patients that law were, went out of the intention to treat protocol. But that's another detail. Sorry, I can't go forward for some reason. Okay, thank you. Very important in material methods is the size of your sample. If it's a controlled randomized trial or you have a power calculation, you can do power calculations for trials that are not only randomized controlled. If sometimes in case control studies, you do a power calculation as well. And that power calculation I'm gonna talk about in a, in, in, in a few minutes is makes use of the expected difference or the delta, the type one and the type two errors. Now don't shut your eyes and say, oh my goodness, he's gonna talk about statistics. Yes, I'm gonna talk about statistics, but I'm a surgeon, I'm not a statistician. I'm gonna to try to tell you what statistics are about. And you have to know what a type one error is. You have to know what a type two error is. It's, it's, it's important. You have to state whether it's explicative or pragmatic. This is something that we find very rarely in a controlled random mouse trial. Whether the hypotheses are one-sided or two-sided. Are we going in one direction or we don't know if one A is better than B, so it's a two-sided test. Nowadays, we talk about superiority studies, non-inferiority studies, or equivalent studies. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. When I started my studies with statistics, we only talked about superiority studies. And this afternoon, if we don't have any papers, or when we run out of papers, we'll talk about a critical appraisal of a, one of the first equivalent studies that was published by Antonio Lacy. That's the first time that the medical literature or the surgical literature ever heard of the word equivalent studies. Anybody know the difference between a superiority and non-inferiority in equivalent study? One hand, oh, two hands. Okay, good. I'll talk about that in a little while. Very important in material methods is the duration, not the length, the duration of inclusion or follow-up and the completeness of that follow-up, especially for randomized controlled trials. If you have lost more than 5%, just a rule of thumb, 5% of your population or that you randomized, this is a very serious bias. And it may be, it has to be discussed, you have to say, I've, the follow-up has shown that there's 8% where it lost a follow-up. This is one of the weaknesses of my study. So you have to state in material methods the duration and the completeness of follow-up. Be very careful when you choose and talk about your endpoints. Choose and talk about clinically meaningful endpoints. These are endpoints that measure something and measure what you're looking at, what's important in that endpoint as related to the outcome. Beware of surrogate outcome measures or surrogate parameters. For instance, a laboratory measurement or a physical sign which is used as a substitute for a clinical meaning endpoint. For instance, the size of your liver when you're treating cirrhosis 
when your end point is quality of life. Obviously, you're gonna treat the cirrhosis, the liver dimension might dis d decrease, you're very happy, but it doesn't relate to quality of life. And don't use it because people will conclude that because you've decreased the spread or the distance or the length of your hepatomegaly that you're improving the quality of life. Everybody understand? Don't use surrogate endpoints. <laughs>